Coming up, it's Indigenous Peoples Day, and all week we take a look at people and places across Turtle Island. Join us for this special edition of the ICT Newscast. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. The ICT Newscast is sponsored by the Indian Land Tenure Foundation, a nonprofit organization serving American Indian nations and people in the recovery and control of their rightful homelands. On the web at ILTF.org. Support for the ICT Newscast with Alia Chavez comes from the Arizona PBS studios in Phoenix at the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communications at Arizona State University. Thank you for joining us. I am Aliyah Chavez. Happy Indigenous Peoples Day and welcome to this special edition of the ICT Newscast. President Joe Biden was the first U.S. leader to proclaim the holiday just two years ago, but the celebration began in Berkeley, California in 1992 as part of the 500th anniversary of when Christopher Columbus arrived in the hemisphere. The day recognizes the resilience and diversity of indigenous peoples in the United States. ICT's Mark Trahant has more about the holiday itself. Did you know the word American used to mean indigenous? In the 1590s, an American was defined as someone from the Western Hemisphere and one of the original inhabitants. It wasn't until the 1740s that the word was expanded to include all the people of the Americas. In 1992, a group of more than 100 indigenous elders and scholars met at Taos Pueblo and drafted a vision about the next 500 years. Some of the words, we the indigenous people of this red quarter of Mother Earth have survived 500 years of genocide, ethnocide, ecocide, racism, oppression, colonization and Christianization. These excesses of Western civilization resulted from contempt for Mother Earth and all our relations, contempt for women, elders, children, and native peoples, and a contempt for a future beyond the present human generation. Despite this, we are still here. We are still here. Native people over the next 500 years must maintain. The statement went on. Native peoples over the next 500 years must maintain our status as distinct political and cultural communities. Indian nations expect the world community to honor and enforce treaties that recognize tribal poverty and sovereignty. Sovereignty is the inherent right of Indian nations to govern all actions within our own countries based upon traditional systems and laws that arise from the people themselves. Sovereignty includes the right of native nations to freely live and develop socially, economically, culturally, spiritually, and politically. The document called for the right to culture, territory, and wealth. It also made a generational promise, a bond, with all the world's peoples who understand the relationship and responsibility to all aspects of creation. It also made a generational promise, a bond with all the world's peoples who understand their relationship and responsibility to all aspects of the creation, and a future of global friendship and the integrity of diverse cultures. Our visions was a historic gathering of 100 native writers, artists, and wisdom keepers at Taos Pueblo. It was co-chaired by Suzanne Schoen Harjo and Oren Lyons and sponsored by the Morning Star Institute and the 1992 Alliance. In Phoenix, Arizona, Mark Trahant, ICT News. That promise included the coming generation of Native people, something that we celebrate today. Indeed, there is documentary evidence of that coming generation, stories affirmed by the work of Matika Wilbur. She is an author, photographer, and podcast host. Her book, A Perfect Vehicle for Indigenous Peoples Day, is Project 562. Matika developed the collection after years of photographing and interviewing Indigenous people from over 500 federally recognized tribes. ICT's Paris Wise has this interview with her. So you are the author and photographer of this book, Project 562, which is hitting shelves today. Congratulations. 
Thank you so much. Yeah, it's really exciting. <laughs> what is Project 562? Well, Project 562 is a year, it took like, I started in 2012. It's taken me many, many years of <laughs> traveling around the country uh, with the goal of visiting uh, more than 562 federally recognized tribes in the United States. When I started the project, that uh, was the original goal. And then as time went on, I also would visit with, you know, urban native communities, with uh, international native communities, you know, with tribes that are still fighting for recognition. You know, the plenary power of Congress is always in flux. And so I spent uh, eight years. I started in Washington and went through Oregon and California, what is now known as Oregon and California, uh, and, and around the country, really, in circles multiple times and into like Alaska several times. And um, I photographed about 1,200 people. And I went to about 450 tribal communities. And I interviewed sub my subjects and talked with folks about a wide range of topics, you know, from sovereignty to self-determination, nation building, you know, environmental justice, climate justice. We talked about indigenous feminisms and rematriation and decolonization and you know, we had conversations about love and death and trauma and healing and, you know, everything in between. So uh, the book that's uh, coming out this week is a collection of those uh, stories and interviews that are collated into uh, what we're calling profiles. Wow. Well, what a journey. I mean, you even sold everything you owned. You got rid of your apartment. What, you know, what was that decision-making process? and why you wanted to embark on this. I didn't have enough funding to, uh, you know, like be on the road and to also keep an apartment. And so I had to kind of make the decision, which was one or the other. <laughs> so, yeah. So in the, in the beginning, I spent quite a bit of time in my Honda. I traveled initially in a Honda and, and, you know, I relied on the con the kindness of Indian country. I slept on couches and went to community functions and, and, you know, it was really supported by the community. And then as time went on, you know, I was able to gather more support. We launched a second Kickstarter. Uh, foundations decided to support the work that I was doing. And then I was able, you know, to upgrade to living in an RV, which was definitely, you know, van life was a lot of fun. And then, and it, yeah, that's how I did it. This book is, you know, photography. It's a physical book. Why was that the format you chose to tell these stories? I, uh, over the years have, I worked in several different mediums. Um, you know, I, I had a blog for many years that I published on weekly on my Project 562 website. We published hundreds of entries. Uh, I had a YouTube channel for a while and we made, a, I think we made about 70 films, short films. And uh, I also have a podcast called All My Relations. And uh, that's, a, it's really an incredible platform. We have a lot of listeners, you know, we, we just reached the million listener threshold. So that's really exciting to have a podcast to, to discuss relationality and all its complexity. And, you know, uh, I've also with this project developed curriculum. So we have, uh, you know, like, uh, like a 40 page curriculum guide that accompanies the publication of the book. And, you know, the book is, you know, a really great, a tangible uh, it's like that, you know, a tangible object that I can give to people that really encapsulates, you know, so many different stories and people that I've encountered along the way. Uh, of course, I've also done exhibitions, right? I have an exhibition up right now in Santa Monica. That's uh, a 72 piece collection that will be traveling and going to New Orleans and then uh, to Michigan. And so that's a, another exhibition, you know, like it's been in exhibition form several times in several different locations but yeah the the book is uh, certainly a, a new vessel to carry the stories and I'm pretty excited about it as a really accomplished a storyteller you mentioned you had already published preliminary content for this project and of course your all my relations podcast is incredible what do you really want people to take away from this book you know the book is a is for me is what I think of as like my love letter to Indian country. You know, it's uh, 
all of these incredible stories. Uh, and really it's a time capsule, right? Because these are like, you know, people that I photographed seven years ago or five years ago or three years ago, you know, and they represent people where they were at on that day of their journey. For me, like I started this project because I want our children to have the opportunity to see themselves reflected properly. I think that it's wildly unjust that our students don't have the opportunity to open up a textbook, you know, a 500 page book that has adequate representation of our people. And, you know, I started this project for that very reason, because I was a teacher at the tribal school of my res, because I wanted to be able to provide a resource to my own students that could show them how incredibly beautiful and intelligent and resilient and thriving and, and human, right? We are. And in uh, all of the many, uh, in all of the many ways that informs that we come in as indigenous people, right? We're not a monolith. And so we, um, we deserve to see the uniqueness and celebrate the, uh, celebrate our own people. Our children need that. And so for me, when, when I made this book, I made it for that purpose. And, and I feel, you know, like blessed and humbled and honored uh, to have been able to bear witness to so many incredible people and stories and communities and to get to share some of that with people. You're literally bringing everyone in with you on this journey to be exposed and learn about these communities. I can't imagine how difficult it must have been to pick and choose what was going to make it in the book just based off of every interaction um, and story that you came across. In a perfect world, I'll get to publish four volumes and then everybody can see the whole collection. And if not, then I'll, I'll may eventually make a website where it all will live. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Matika Wilbur, for taking the time to talk about Project 562. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Matika Wilbur showed us the people, but there is a deeper idea behind being Indigenous. And Laura Harris says it's those Indigenous values that are key to understanding a program started by a Comanche woman more than 50 years ago. LaDonna Harris, now in her 90s, has developed Native leaders across the world. ICT Shirley Snavy spoke to her daughter, Laura, who now leads her nonprofit organization. Laura Harris has led Americans for Indian Opportunities for 25 years. It's the organization started by her mother, LaDonna, in 1970. Simply put, it's a leadership development organization, but over the years, it's become much more. Welcome, Laura. Thank you, Shirley. It's good to see you. So in a nutshell, what is Americans for Indian Opportunities? It's never stayed the same. We're celebrating our 53rd uh, anniversary this year. And we've worked on just about every issue there is. Uh, Mom really started working in the area of urban Indians. Uh, she was appointed by President Johnson to the National Council on Indian Opportunity uh, out of the White House that uh, Vice President Humphrey chaired. And um, out of that work, she thought that, you know, urbans were invisible. And uh, so she spent a lot of time holding uh, hearings around the country in, in cities to learn more about this invis invisible population. <laughs> it's like 50 years later and, and we're still kind of invisible, <laughs> but, but AIO has come full circle and we're working on urban issues again. Um, but Americans for Indian Opportunity uh, advocates for indigenous rights here in the United States and around the world. And we've done that in many different ways, like I said, uh, but it's through uh, Indigenous values-based leadership development, uh, hosting several uh, Indigenous uh, networks, national and international networks. Um, and uh, we're also working to help indigenize other people's leadership programs. So we haven't had a new cohort of the ambassadors program uh, uh, recently uh, because we've been working with other organizations to help them uh, include indigenous values and indigenous world of view in their leadership programs. That's been really fascinating. And um, also we have been providing a lot of what we call Indian 101 beyond cultural competency. 
uh, I think Black Lives Matter uh, and um, and COVID uh, really uh, in, built people's interest in learning more about other peoples and especially particularly people of color. So we've provided Indian 101, we call it to uh, uh, foundations, corporations, anybody who wants to do business in Indian country or wants to know more. You know, of course, uh, we feel like uh, uh, we're filling a vacuum in the US education system. And what we found over our years trying to change policy in Washington, DC, is you can't change policy uh, unless you educate the decision makers. So you could have three PhDs and still not know that tribes were uh, governments within the federal system and uh, just exactly what tribal sovereignty allows tribes uh, to undertake. And so we found in order to ch make change, you have to uh, educate people. And uh, we've been very successful at that. Uh, my mother started this as a very simple presentation on an easel and she'd draw some funny looking pictures. <laughs> but we've upgraded a little bit. We have a, a slideshow now and uh, really been able to I think about 3,500 people last year we were able to touch and, and uh, that's a big part, building awareness, changing the tragedy narrative and uh, providing information about contemporary indigenous peoples uh, is what we feel is part of our mission. And I think that has a lot to do with the 350 ambassadors who've gone through the program now. They represent uh, about 40 states, 150 different tribes and six countries. And of course, the Maori in Aotearoa, New Zealand, they've actually started their own leadership program. So of that 350, 150 are, are uh, from New Zealand. Um, but they, those values really resonated. And we found that our travels uh, throughout the world, uh, that indigenous communities uh, uh, really uh, feel like those uh, values resonate for their culture. Um, and we found them to be fairly universal. The other thing that I would imagine it would be important for all of these leaders is to meet each other. Yes, what we find uh, that's very different from other sorts of leadership programs, you know, surely you may get uh, maybe one Native American to participate in a national program. Um, I've been that one, <laughs> or I've been, I've been uh, the runner up to that one <laughs> to participate in those programs. And you, you, you get some little nuggets, uh, but really what we found is it doesn't, it, it doesn't um, compute back to your home, back to your uh, environment, your community. What do Native American leaders need, both tribal, nonprofit, urban leaders? Um, and, and what we found is really centering them in their cultural identity. Um, that's what makes a good leader. Uh, and I think that's probably universal as well, not just uh, for indigenous peoples, uh, but knowing who you are and where you came from and being proud of that and being able to lead from that. You know, we've been told so many times, uh, Native Americans and, and people of color and women, that we're less than because of our culture, because of our identity or our gender. Um, but in fact, it's absolutely the opposite. We are more because of our culture. And when we bring our cultural identity and our values uh, to everything we do, and particularly to work, in, whether that's in a corporation or a foundation, um, that we're a stronger leader and that we have a lot more to contribute. We think that these uh, values, we affectionately call them the four R's or Hayeroque. Hayeroque in Comanche means uh, the number four, but it also means just right. This is just right. And these four R's, relationships, responsibility, reciprocity, and redistribution, uh, they, they, these are human values, um, but we think that they, folks need to be reminded of them. That was Laura Harris from Americans for Indian Opportunity. There was so much activity in the 1970s. There was a modern treaty in Alaska, the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act, and fishing wars in Washington state. Finally, we end this special edition with another iconic story, Wounded Knee and this year's 50th anniversary. We have this story from ICT Shirley Snavy and Stuart Huntington. The song of the American Indian movement mingled with eruptions of celebratory gunfire. The 
very place where hundreds of Lakota people were slaughtered by U.S. soldiers in 1890, and where AIM activists, including the late Carter Camp, took a stand in 1973. Today we're still here. Today we're strong because of our relatives who fought here in 73. Today we're proud to be who we are as native people, indigenous people of this land. I want to say we we'll be like Bill Means, brother of the late AIM leader Russell Means, who helped lead the occupation, reminded the crowd not to forget the 19th century massacre. There's almost 300 men, women, and children in that grave behind us. Every time we go by here, we're reminded about the United States government, what they did to our people. And so uh, that's the reason why we, we, we resist then mean switch to talk about 1973 and the present. Remember, we came here for the 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty. We didn't just come here to raise hell. We had to make a statement to tell the world that Indians are still alive. They're still our land and the Black Hills are not for sale. <laughs> The 1973 occupation began as a protest against the heavy-handed tribal government of Dick Wilson, but evolved into a 71-day standoff against federal law enforcement and demands for treaty rights. In the end, at least three people were killed. Veterans of the occupation gathered to swap stories. I feel like the, the spirit, the energy brought us here, you know, me, for sure. And um, I was looking for something, you know, to... Uh, validate ourselves, you know, our own self-searching. And um, in a time when uh, it wasn't good to be Indian, in my time, you know, or my youth. And uh, so, uh, for better or worse, you know, I realized that you have to be who you are, you know, and you should be who you are. The federal marshals had all the high grounds and we had bunkers and uh, support teams down here in the middle. And the trading post was over here in our security headquarters. And so, it's all gone now. You know, you know what strikes me about it is as soon as uh, it ended, the federal people came in and they, they bulldozed all the main structures and buildings here. And I think they were trying to erase this out of history, that it would go away and people would forget about the massacre that happened originally and the rebellion that happened here again to, because people haven't forgotten. And so coming back here, I think is a way of rebuilding that struggle and the structures and the fight that took place here to keep the memory alive and to care for future generations. And so this is a real strong statement, I think, today, everybody being here for the 50th anniversary, the ones of us that are still around. Ken Tiger served in Vietnam before joining the 73 occupation. Looking back on it, there was a lot of similarities. There was a lot of farmers in Vietnam who were didn't want anything to do with the war. They just wanted to take care of their property, their families, their communities. And basically, that's what the people here were trying to do too. But there's uh, fractions within the government who were trying to take what they had, what little they had to begin with, they were trying to take it away from them. And they were trying to tell them how to live, what to do, and things like that. And that's not uh, the way it should be. He brought a picture of himself from 73 on his phone and pointed to the spot where, back then, he dug community toilets. Willard Carlson remembers the era as a tough time for natives. There was a lot of things that was happening in Indian country everywhere, like uh, heavy hand police, uh, white bartender killed a friend of mine, uh, highway patrols took an Indian man and executed him. And, Highway 101, Arcade of California. And he remembers getting ready on the West Coast to join the occupation. And I went off recruiting warriors and weapons. And my mother, she uh, she had about eight rifles she gave me from her family, or her man at that time, you know, just as long as they were operational. So we drove over here and it was a very dangerous time, very bad. Looking ahead, things are perhaps better, but the work is not done. It is still sad that we unfortunately face some of the, the same struggles today, and so that's what keeps many of us um, as helpers and continuing to show up and help where we can uh, for future generations and of course honoring those that have gone before us.
the fight is not over. The fight continues to this day. And I think it'll, it'll continue for the rest of our lives. You know, generation through generation. I mean, we're still here today. 50 years later, we're still here today. Um, you know, a lot of our, our, our people, you know, we, we continue to, to do our daily battles with, you know, the, the government, um, with, you know, the, the, the everyday life, the, the struggles, the different things that basically um, the, the system is basically set up for us to fail as indigenous people. And we continue to fight that to this day and prove them wrong. And we'll continue to prove them wrong, you know, every day. In Wounded Knee, South Dakota with Shirley Snavy, Stuart Huntington, ICT News. Around the world, Indigenous people are celebrated. In Canada, Indigenous People's Day is always marked by the summer solstice. And in much of the world, Indigenous People's Day is August 9th, the day set aside by the United Nations. And that's a slice of our Indigenous world. For all the latest, visit ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people.